Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. As mentioned, I, during my day job, I work as an archivist, so if anyone wants to talk about metadata or information science or anything after breakfast, please come find me. It's a deep interest of mine. Um, so, the other day I was going through some old papers when I found the notebook, and the, the notebook that eventually became Catherine House. And on the first page, I'd written the sentence, I want to write a book about a girl who falls in love with a house. And it was so funny all these years later to see that sentence. I was like, wow, I really, <laughs> I had such a clear idea, and it was so precise. And I was like, I think I, that's the book that I wrote. So in Catherine House, this elite college, it isn't just a house, but it's a character. It's dark and dusty and crumbling and isolated and castle-like in its grandeur. And our narrator, Ines, arrives at the house on the run from this dark, obscure past that we don't know much about, and soon this house becomes more of a home than anything that she's ever known. It's a wild, strange, fierce home, but it's hers. And it isn't until a mysterious tragedy that Ines begins to suspect that the school might be hiding a dangerous agenda. For myself, I've always been interested in elite institutions with dangerous agendas. My grandfather went to Yale University in the 1950s. Um, he was one of four black men in his class, and his dorm sat by a courtyard that they called the slave quarters, and the glee club, which he was a part of, toured through segregated hotels. And my grandparents still to this day don't love to talk about his experience there. But funnily enough, his son, my dad, also ended up going to Yale too, and had a similarly poisonous experience. He ended up taking a mental health leave and then dropping out. So, like many black daughters, I was raised to believe in the weight of a good education. I was told, go to school, do your homework, and everything will be fine. <laughs> but I was also raised to not quite trust these institutions. And in fact, when it was my turn to apply to college, my dad said, you can go anywhere you want as long as it's not Yale. And then, of course, I ended up going to Yale. <laughs> I like to think that it was like my cool teenage rebellion moment, but it was really just kind of practical. It was like good distance from home, and I wanted to major in art history to have a good program, whatever. It was actually quite boring reasons. Um, <laughs> so I did go, and obviously I was happy to go to this, you know, this really amazing school, but I did not put it on a pedestal the way a lot of my classmates did. I felt no affection for what they call good old Yale when they have, you know, the men in their tuxes and their white gloves singing the songs and stuff. I was like, I'm not into this whole thing. <laughs> um, I thought of it as this old antiquated institution. I really just wanted to get my degree and then get out of there. But these days, as we know, colleges really sell themselves on quality of life. Um, so of course, I ended up having an amazing time because you know there's 13 different dining halls. There's um, all, the, all the the dorms are like they've right, been renovated like two seconds ago. Everything is gleaming. Everything is gorgeous. The classes were amazing. They're difficult, but you're just learning so much. Um, and, and one of the most amazing things is your friends are so close around you. You're any, anytime you want to see anyone who you care about, I guess besides your family, but <laughs> they're just down the hall, they're in the library, you're all working on your papers until five in the morning. It's this really amazing experience, and there's a lot of stress, of course, but even the stress, it, it kind of makes everything just feel all that much more poignant. Everything is so close, everything is so condensed, every emotion is just so heightened. And for me, those years on campus felt kind of outside of time in a way, um, and it felt more real than real even as it was happening. And I think a lot of people have experiences like that in their lives. For me, it was college. For some people, it might be summer camp. It might be their time on a particular sports team. I wouldn't know, but I've heard. Um, <laughs> falling in love or pregnancy, some particular time in their life that just feels kind of suspended in amber and kind of uh, hyper-vibrant, and maybe not even a particularly good time, but something that just feels more real in particular, almost like nostalgia, but you like feel the nostalgia as it's happening. So after I graduated college, my life became more difficult. My parents divorced, my dad passed away of a sudden illness, and all my friends who had once been so close were now very far away. I had a job, um, but I was so depressed that I wasn't learning anything new, I wasn't meeting anyone new, I wasn't happy, and the world just felt completely gray. Whatever vibrancy or poignancy I felt during those college years was just completely gone. And even though I had no affection for Yale as an institution, suddenly I found that the whole idea of college, of that particular time in my life, started to have, it started to just loom large in my mind. Suddenly it wasn't just college, it was like the years when I was happy. It was like, it had suddenly this weight, it was like this big rainbow bubble of something that I would think about sometimes. Um, it was like, it felt almost like a relationship I had been in and then the, he had promised to love me forever and then he had tossed me out. And I just like, I want, I want to be back there. <laughs> Um, so around that time, right after I graduated, 
the news was full of stories of campus sexual assault. And even though I myself had had a wonderful experience in college, the stories did not surprise me at all. I think that, you know, with the amount of alcohol and people are so young, it's, there's, it was not surprising at all. And even though, um, and I think there's a big part of that is also how the stories of how the colleges had mishandled the crimes, not just the crimes themselves. And uh, with the history of my family, it did none of that surprised me. I had never had any idea that these institutions were really loyal to anyone but themselves. And I, I knew that, and I still wanted to go back there. And I think that's when I wrote that line in the notebook, I want to write a book about a girl who falls in love with a house. Because I wanted it to be the sensation uh, the falling in love not necessarily is something that's pleasant, but that's like thrilling and dangerous and dangerous because it's thrilling. And it's a house not just as a building, but as a whole time and space in a person's life. And that's the story that became Catherine House. As I wrote Catherine House, I was thinking of the kinds of books that I like to read as a little girl. Fairy tales with eerie worlds and haunted houses and lush gothic novels like Rebecca and The Secret Garden and Jane Eyre. All those amazing books that I love to read under my covers with a flashlight. I loved classic literature as a kid. But I had never, much like Yale as an institution, I never had any misapprehension, misapprehension that those stories had been written for me. I knew who had written those books and I knew who I was. I knew I was a black girl growing up in Brooklyn. Um, and even though I loved them, I didn't feel that they were written for me. And so I knew that when I wrote a book, I wanted to honor who I am and who my family and friends are. But it also didn't quite seem fair to me that as a black woman, I was expected kind of to specifically write about race. I, it, it seemed like a paradox. I wanted to write these wild, abstract, gothic fairy tales, not stories about, you know, quote, what it means to be a black woman in America, but I also wanted my books to be true to my experience of the world, and being a black woman in America is part of my experience of the world, and um, that it, that is intrinsically part of my experience whether I want it to be or not, and that I have to decide how I'm going to contend with that is going to be part of my experience of writing the book, um, and that I don't necessarily have the privilege of pretending that race isn't part of uh, my experience of writing and how I present myself to the world. So I decided that the brave thing for me to do in this moment was to write the book that I wanted to write. So I crafted it to be for me and about my friends and their wild diversity and difference, differences in race and class and culture and sexuality. But in this dream world of Catherine House, all these differences exist, but there's not, there's not friction the way there is in the real world. In Catherine House, everyone sits together at the same table in the cafeteria, which in my experience of high school and college is not necessarily the case. But I wanted it to be in this fantasy world. It's, it's, it's a dream, and it's this particular fantasy place, and that's what's happening in this fantasy. Um, so it's, it's this kind of dream world of the sorceresses and monsters, creaking floorboards, whispering winds, daring damsels in ghostly manners, um, but it's revised for our new world and a new conception of what diversity could look like and what these differences could be in a, in a new type of fantasy. So thank you everyone, and I hope you enjoy the story.